Okay, so uh, hello everyone, welcome back. All right, so we are continuing with chapter five on analytic trig. We're going to do more with solving equations and we're going to start with the, uh, the uh, uh, advanced identities, which you should commit to memory, that's the idea. You should try to memorize these and be able to work with them well, all right? So we're here today. Of course we're here today, but <laughs> okay, so we're here. Thursday, October 29th. Actually, the next time we meet is, will be election day. <laughs> I'm tempted to give you updates in the chat, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, but next Tuesday will be election day. Bear in mind the election. Well, it may go beyond that. We'll see. All right. Um, but we'll finish uh, chapter five next time and start um, the additional trig, law of sines, law of cosines on Tuesday. Then we'll finish chapter six next week. 6.5 is an optional section. Um, Okay, and then, uh, by the way, the homework, the current homework's on chapters five through six. I'm still grading the chapter zero. I should get that back, hopefully within a week, I'm hoping. Um, but uh, the homework on, on chapters five and six, okay, will be due a, about a couple weeks from now. Okay, uh, Friday, November 13th. So about two weeks and a day from now, I guess. All right. Okay, so any general questions? Any general questions before we go on? All right, so we are recording. I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, all right. Are you gonna post our grades on Canvas or are you just gonna like have it through email? The no, whole... no I'm, just, I'm just gonna do it through email because uh, the way I do it, uh, I, I, still, I don't know if Canvas is the best way, best way for me to do it. So I think uh, just, I'm used to doing it by email. Well, where I'll give you the cumulative and all that. Okay. And remember, point to point in this class. So it's, it's not too hard to figure out what you need. All right. Um, okay, uh, anything else? Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and start then. All right. Linear forms thus far. Okay. Hi, everyone. We're continuing on section 5.3 on solving trig equations. We've been dealing with linear forms thus far. Now we're going to start dealing with powers. For example, quadratic forms and higher. <laughs> and for these quadratic forms, we may have to factor or maybe use something like the square root method, like before. Uh, remember the square root method. If, if we have something like x squared equals seven, what could x be? Oh, the square root of seven, right? Uh, not so fast. Don't forget what? Plus or minus. And by trig, a lot of students forget to put that <laughs> as part of the square root method. And incidentally, for many of these problems, we often grab solutions from all four quadrants. Not always, but we often get solutions in all four quadrants, as will be the case in our next example which followed up on the last one we did last time. Tangent squared of x minus three equals zero. Now, if we had a tangent of x term in here, we might like having the zero isolated, but since we have tangent squared of x here with no tangent of x term, we, we may as well isolate the tangent squared of x term and use the square root method. So we're not setting ourselves up for factoring. So we do that by adding three to both sides. We get tangent squared of x equals three. We're isolating the squared expression. And then we apply the square root method. Tangent of x equals what? Not just the square root of three, plus or minus the square root of three. Again, on exams, Students often forget the plus or minus. It might be wishful thinking. But if anything, this will make things easier for us because, because of this, we're going to end up with solutions in all four quadrants, which in some ways makes things easier for us. All right. So first of all, we might want to ask the question, well, where is tangent of x equal to the square root of three, positive root three? And we dealt with this kind of issue before. We were basically asking for the reference angle that we're going to get. Uh, remember that the square root of three is about 1.7. It was that steep slope that we had in our table, right? Our steep slope 
So the reference angle is going to be this steep angle, pi over three. Wow, that's a messy circle there, huh? Let's, <laughs> let's uh, move this around a bit. There we go. Pi over three, that's going to be the reference angle for all of our solutions. And in fact, it turns out that the solution set will be all angles, all real radian measures, whose reference angle is pi over three. We want all the brothers, all the brothers for pi over three, including, of course, the coterminal twins. So we want all the representatives for all four of these brother points in all four quadrants. Tangent, remember, was positive root three in quadrants one and three. Tangent is negative in quadrants two and four. But we don't even have to really draw that distinction. We want values of x or angles where tangent is either positive root three or negative root three. So we don't even have to distinguish really between these quadrants. We want these brothers in all four quadrants. It doesn't even matter if the tangent value was positive or negative. Although I hope you know uh, which ones go with which quadrants. We don't have to worry. We want all the brothers for pi over three. So what would be an efficient way of expressing the solution set? How do we pick up all the brothers for pi over three efficiently? Well, uh, pi over three is a great representative for this purple point. And, and if we do plus pi n, we're then going to pick up all the brothers for this point in quadrant three. If we do plus pi n, where n is integer. Likewise, I'll do this in blue. If we take negative pi over three, we can add pi n and get all the brothers for this point. Uh, and then uh, if we add two pi n and so forth, we also get all the brothers for this point as well. Okay, so once again, uh, how do we get all the brothers? So from pi over three, this is pi over three plus zero pi and then plus one pi, we're here in quadrant three. If we do plus two pi, we're back to this point in quadrant one, plus three pi over here, plus four pi over here, and so forth. If you do minus one pi, then you go clockwise over to this quadrant three point. Minus two pi, clockwise back to a coterminal twin, and so forth. And again, the same deal for negative pi over three. Negative pi over three plus zero pi, plus one pi, plus two pi, plus three pi, and so forth. Same for minus one pi, minus two pi, and so forth. We pick up all the brothers in quadrants three, sorry, quadrants four and two. So um, here is the most efficient form for the solution set. The set of all x values in the reals such that x is of the form pi over three plus pi n, where n is an integer. Z, I, I may have put r before, z. <laughs> All right. Plus or minus pi over three. And with the plus pi n, we're picking up all the brothers, all the brothers. Now, if you don't like using this type of periodicity, you could go straight to the coterminal twins. Uh, this guy plus two pi n, or this guy plus two pi n, or maybe four pi over three plus two pi n, or maybe this guy, or five pi over three plus two pi n, where n is integer. Or if you don't like negative angles, instead of negative pi over three, remember, you can take any representative for either red point. Uh, you could take two pi over three plus pi n if you want these two red points over here. So instead of plus or minus pi over three plus pi n, you could do pi over three plus pi n, and you pick up all the representatives for the purple points, or x equals two pi over three plus pi n. Uh, that's another way of picking up all the, red, all the representatives for the red points. And like I said before, uh, if you'd rather think in terms of coterminal twins, you could do this plus two pi n, or this plus two pi n, or a rep here plus two pi n, or a rep here plus two pi n, or n is integer. That would take a lot of writing, but some students feel more comfortable with that. Books do try to aim for the most efficient expression. They'll probably aim for this. Uh, on some sort of exam, I would accept any of those forms, though. 
any form that is correct and that is reasonable. Okay. Uh, oh, and by the way, we could also go to Desmos. Uh, let's do that in the next video. All right, uh, any questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay, uh, I think I'm going to go to Desmos now. Hi everyone, uh, we just solved the equation tangent squared of x minus three equals zero, uh, or its equivalent equation, tangent squared of x equals three. Let's check our solution set for both these equations on Desmos. Tangent squared of x equals three. Uh, here's y equals tangent squared of x. Uh, remember that on Desmos, you should input it as the square of tangent of x. In fact, in your calculus class, it's good to write tangent squared of x as the square of tangent of x. And then over here, y equals three. The solution set, the values of x where this will equal this, those will be the solutions of this equation and also this original equation up here. So let's click this, the graph of y equals tangent squared of x. Uh, uh, it's a square here, so it never goes negative. We have all these up view graphs over here. Uh, and then we put in y equals three. Oh, and by the way, uh, there are VAs at uh, x equals pi over two, x equals three pi over two, and so forth. But Desmos does not automatically put in VAs. We graph y equals three, this horizontal line. Uh, now this, uh, uh, this intercept is not a solution point, by the way. But where do we get solution points for this system? The solutions to this equation and this equation will be x coordinates for these intersection points. Look over here, pi over three comma three, of course the y coordinate is three. Pi over three is a solution, well, look over here, pi over three is a solution. Uh, how about over here, two pi over three, four pi over three, five pi over three. Well, two pi over three, four pi over three, five pi over three. Okay. Also negative pi over three, if you go backwards, uh, oh, backwards here, here's negative pi over three, right? Over here, if we go up to seven pi over three, that's coterminal to pi over three. So you see, we sweep through quadrants one, two, three, four, then back to quadrant one, seven pi over three is coterminal to pi over three, and so forth. We pick up solutions in all four quadrants. By the way, we could have also looked at it in terms of the uh, original equation, tangent squared of x minus three equals zero. So graph y equals tangent squared of x minus three, what happens? Graph goes down three units, let's graph y equals zero, that's the x-axis, and here the solutions will correspond to x-intercepts for this function over here. Right. Again, pi over three, two pi over three, and so forth. So Desmos is a nice way to check your solution set. Uh, it's not perfect, but we feel pretty confident. Next up, we're going to do another nonlinear equation in trig functions. Uh, any questions? Uh, you don't have to use Desmos, but it's a nice way of visualizing things. Any questions? Any questions? Hi everyone, so in 5.3, we're going to solve another equation that's nonlinear in a trig function. In this case, it's third degree or cubic in sine of x. This is way more complicated than the last problem we did, so something as simple as the square root method won't work. Uh, here, it turns out we're going to need to do some real factoring. Now, you may look at this equation and you may think, well, hey, I would love to divide both sides by sine of x but that's dangerous because remember, sine of x could be zero in, var in value and it is illegal to divide by zero, right? So I would suggest against dividing both sides by sine of x because then you would lose solutions x for which sine of x equals zero. In fact, uh, we do get solutions, values for x that make this true when sine of x equals zero. So it's really inappropriate to divide both sides by sine of x, unless 
you consider sine of x equals zero as a special case. So if you solve sine of x equals zero separately and accept those solutions, uh, A-C-C-E-P-T, accept or bring in those solutions, that's fine. Uh, and in fact, that's a technique in differential equations to consider this thing separately. But in any case, bear in mind that you are going to get solutions here where sine of x equals zero. So it's suggested that you not divide both sides by sine of x. You will get solutions when sine of x is zero. Anyway, I would suggest a factoring technique. And if you're going to use a factoring technique, we eventually want to isolate zero on one side. Here, I guess the right-hand side would be easier. And before we even do that, you might want to do a substitution, either now or later. Uh, let u equal sine of x. That substitution may be helpful. Let's do it now. So when we go to u, we get 2u cubed plus u equals 3u squared. And this may be more comforting to you. It looks more familiar. We have an algebraic equation in u. It's a polynomial equation in u. Again, we have a lot of powers of u here. It may be safest to isolate 0 on one side. Let's subtract 3u squared from both sides. And at the same time, let's write the left-hand side in descending powers. So we get 2u cubed, and then negative 3u squared over here, because we're subtracting 3u squared from both sides. We still have plus u, and then equals 0. Remember, when we're setting ourselves up for factoring, we want to isolate 0 on one side. And then, how would you factor the left-hand side? What would you first factor out? The GCF. And the GCF is just u. So we factor out the GCF, which is u. The exponents decrease by 1 because we're dividing. 2u squared minus 3u plus 1 is the other factor. And we have a product equaling 0. But we can factor this further. And I'll give you a few moments to think about how to factor that. You can factor this old school over z, the integers. All right. Uh, now, you could also use the quadratic formula and get to the point, because we want to find the zeros. But you can factor this old school. Uh, we get 2u minus 1 and u minus 1. Remember, we need the same signs here because the constant term here is positive. Notice the outer product, negative 2u, plus the inner product, negative 1u. They combine to the linear term here, negative 3u. And now we have a product of three linear factors equaling 0. It doesn't get any better than this. We can go ahead and apply the zero factor property. This product equals 0 if and only if at least one of these factors equals zero. Let's go through them one by one. All right, so we have three cases to consider where u equals zero, where two u minus one equals zero, and where u minus one equals zero. First of all, let's consider what happens when u equals zero. All right u was sine of x, we want to solve sine of x equals zero. Not so fast. Think about it. What are all real solutions for sine of x equals zero? Draw the unit circle. Remember that on the unit circle, sine of x corresponds to the vertical, or y-coordinate, on the unit circle. We want to know where the, where the vertical coordinate is zero, like y. Well, at this point, the east point, and at this point, the west point. And what are all the representatives, all the angles that correspond to these two points? Well, we have zero, pi, two pi, and so forth. We also have negative one pi, negative two pi, and so forth. Basically, all integer multiples of pi x equals pi n, 
where n is in the set of integers. And in fact, we may not even have to write this now. It might be a better idea to collect these points at the end because we might be able to exploit symmetry. In this problem, it turns out that symmetry doesn't help us too much beyond this, the pi n symmetry. Uh, but later on, we'll see examples where we can get some nice symmetry, and we may not have to solve these things uh, factor by factor, case by case. But we do get solutions that correspond to all the representatives for east point and west point. Know that. Now for case two. When does 2u minus 1 equal 0? Well, u was sine of x. Well, first, uh, you could solve this for u. Let's do the algebra first. Add 1 to both sides and divide by 2. u equals 1 half. And then u was sine of x. Sine of x equals 1 half. Again, not so fast. Think about it. What are all the real solutions for sine of x equals 1 half? Uh, this will have solutions, real solutions, because 1 half is in the range. In fact, it's a famous special sine value. Uh, you should get these solutions exactly. Go. All right. Well, first off, in what two quadrants will sine, S-I-N-E, be positive? In quadrants one and, think, y or vertical coordinate, 2. So we're going to want solutions in quadrants 1 and 2. What's the arc sine of 1 half? What's the key reference angle in quadrant 1? Sine of what is 1 half? We're talking this kind of low point over here. Pi over 6. That's the flatter angle, pi over 6. So we want pi over 6 and its coterminal twins. So we want pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer. That picks up all of our solutions in quadrant 1 from this case. But we also want all the brothers in quadrant 2. Uh, the most famous brother is 5 pi over 6, and we also want its coterminal twins. So put plus 2 pi n, again, where n is an integer. And then we'll get all of the solutions for this equation for case two, sine of x equals 1 half. All the representatives for this point in quadrant one and for this point in quadrant two. Now, it looks like there's symmetry about this vertical axis, but unfortunately, we tend not to exploit symmetry about the vertical axis unless you have pi n, these guys over here. There's not a good way of exploiting symmetry here with the pi over 6 point and the 5 pi over 6 point. All right, what about case 3? u minus 1 equals 0. Solve for u first. Well, u equals 1. Oh, oh by the way, if you, want, if you try to use symmetry on here, you get this ugly form. Ugh. Pi over 2 plus or minus pi over 3 and then coterminal. <laughs> anyway, going to the next part here. u minus 1 equals 0. OK, u equals 1. Solve sine of x equals 1. Well, we want all the representatives for the North Pole over here. The most famous rep is pi over 2, and we want all coterminal twins. Almost every student would write this down as a solution, as the solutions for uh, sine of x equals 1. All right, so the final step is to bring everything together. <laughs> the solution set is the set of all x in the reals, such that x equals pi n. Uh, those were the solutions from case 1 over here. or x equals pi over 6 plus pi n, or 5 pi over 6 plus pi n. I should say 2 pi n. <laughs> so these all came from case 2. 
or the North Pole situation, pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. That's our third case over here, where n is integer. And unfortunately, it doesn't really get much better than that. <laughs> if you were to gather all of these points of interest on the unit circle, uh, well, yes, we can use symmetry for the pi n case, case one, x equals pi n for each point and west point. But we're not able to exploit symmetry for the pi over six point and the five pi over six point. As for pi over two, we're just picking up him and his coterminal twins. So unfortunately, it doesn't get much better than this. Now, if you were to try to uh, check your solutions on Desmos, all right, now remember the original equation went this left-hand side equal this right-hand side. Now, if you try to graph y equals the left-hand side and y equals the right-hand side, that's y equals left-hand side. That's y equals right-hand side. Ooh, it's kind of hard to see the intersection points, but Desmos tries to figure them out. Pi over 6, 0 also. Pi over 2, pi pi over 6, pi. Uh, uh, you might have to zoom in to kind of see the intersection points better. Uh, actually, it might be easier to subtract this from both sides, okay, and set this big ugly guy here <laughs> equal to zero. Find the zeros of this guy, All right? And that may be easier to see. So we have solutions at x equals zero, x equals pi over six, pi over two, pi pi over six, pi, and so forth. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, oh, and, and also if you go on, well, pi is the last one before we hit 2 pi. Uh, I want to mention also that if we were just asked to find the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, so what if we only wanted the solutions in this interval from 0 to 2 pi? Uh, remember that 2 pi is coterminal with 0. So even though 0 is a solution, we're going to count it, but we're not going to count 2 pi. If we go around the world, we only have to go around half the world, really. There are no solutions in quadrants 3 or 4. But when we pick up all the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, what do we get? We get I'll put this in blue. We get 0. We get pi over 6, pi over 2, 5 pi over 6, and pi. We want to explicitly mention pi here. So your solution set would be 0, comma, pi over 6, comma, pi over 2, comma, 5 pi over 6, comma, pi. In fact, you don't even have to list these in order. You could go by cases. Case 1 gave us 0 and pi. Case 2 gave us these two guys. Case 3 gave us pi over 2. You don't even have to write this in order. Sets are unordered. Uh, here, I did list the solutions in increasing order. And these correspond to the x-coordinates of these intersection points for the black and red graph. When I reframed it as a zeros problem. So, 0, power 6, power 2, 5, power 6, and pi. Because it was harder to look at the left-hand and right-hand graphs. All right. Next, we're going to start using some identities. All right, uh, any questions before we go on? Um, uh, so yeah, it was pi in for the first piece, because we use symmetry uh, uh, with the west point and the east point, but uh, do pi in if we're not using symmetry. OK, questions? All right. I got to remember to keep checking the chat. <laughs> Sometimes I get enthralled by the graphs. OK. Hi, everyone. We're still solving trig equations in section 5.3. Uh, and we can use our old friends, the identities, like the Pythagorean identities. For example, solve 2 sine cubed of x plus sine of x plus 3 cosine squared of x equals 3. Uh, 
on the left side, you see that one of these things is not like the others. So then we have this idea of internal consistency, which I kind of mentioned in 5.2, uh, well, consistency, making the pieces look like each other. So how can we make cosine squared of x look more like these guys? How can we write cosine squared of x in terms of sine squared of x? <clears throat> the Pythagoreans. I don't think cofunction will be as nice. So by a Pythagorean identity, we're going to substitute cosine squared of x with its equivalent, 1 minus sine squared of x. Remember, that goes in parentheses. Whenever you do a substitution, be prepared to put grouping symbols. And here we have to put them. We distribute the 3. Uh, and we see that uh, the 3s can subtract off on both sides. We're left with a 0 on the right side. And this might look familiar, especially if you substitute, put it in descending powers. It turns out we basically get the same equation that we got last time in our previous example. Uh, I'm playing one of my tricks on you. Uh, this is equivalent to the equations we dealt with in the previous example. We get the same solution set. Okay, so it was, uh, it was this over here, same solution set because the equation here turned out to be equivalent. The point I wanted to make was that you sometimes apply identities, like the Pythagoreans, in order to get an equation we can solve. Hi, everyone. We're now going to solve multiple angle trig equations. These might be more accurately called multiple that went faster than I expected, so let me uh, <laughs> caption this. All right. Hi, everyone. We're now going to solve multiple angle trig equations. These might be more accurately called multiples of angles. We're going to solve equations like these. 2 sine of 4x is equal to negative root 3. And I must tell you that personally, I think books often do a horrible job of teaching this section. I think the key solution here is substitution. That's a key trick here to use a substitution. Now, uh, we could isolate the sine expression first, uh, divide by 2, right? Sine of 4x equals negative root 3 over 2, which, by the way, is a known sine value. And let's do a substitution. Uh, I'm used to thinking of angles being like theta. But if you want to use u, that's fine. I'm going to substitute theta, or u, equals 4x. And I now want to solve this trig equation for theta. Solve this for theta for now, which is a standard linear form problem. All right, so let's think in terms of theta. Theta is the angle. All right. Well, old school. In what two quadrants is the sine value negative? Think y-coordinate here. In quadrants three and four. But it might be helpful to find the reference angle in quadrant one. I'd like to know the inverse sine of positive root 3 over 2. So the sine, I'll put this in blue. The sine of what famous angle is positive root 3 over 2? The sine of what famous angle is positive root 3 over 2? The arc sine of root 3 over 2? Think high point is pi over 3. Pi over 3. Okay. We're looking at this high point over here. Now, pi over 3 itself is not a solution for theta in this equation because its sine value is positive root 3 over 2, but it is the brother 
it's the reference angle for all the solutions. And so we basically want all of the brothers that are in quadrants three and four. The most famous positive representatives for these two points are four pi over three and five pi over three. Now, it's true that instead of five pi over three, we might have preferred negative pi over three before. But see, in a follow-up example, we're going to find the solutions between zero and two pi. And if that's going to be the long run goal, I'm actually going to want a positive twin over here. So if we want the solutions between zero and two pi, eventually, and that is my follow up example, then I may actually prefer the five pi over three to the negative pi over three. Although in terms of this general solution, negative pi over three may be more convenient. If you do want all real solutions for theta here, which eventually will get us all real solutions for x over here. All right. So if we take these two representatives for these two points, then we get the solution set for theta. Okay. Uh, we get the set of all real values of theta of the form 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n because we want all the coterminal twins where n is an integer. Uh, or theta could be of the form 5 pi over 3, or negative pi over 3, plus 2 pi n, where n is integer. I want a representative for this quadrant 4 point and all the coterminal twins. But are we done? Are we done? No, because these are our solutions for theta. But the original equation is in x. We need to solve for x. Still, this is a good intermediate step. What's the relationship between theta and x? Theta equals 4x. So let's perform this sort of back reverse substitution. We're going to go back from theta to 4x. And in fact, as you do your work, you might just want to write 4x under the theta so that you don't have to repeat these right-hand sides over here. Theta is 4x. We're going back to x. We eventually have to. So now we have, down here, 4x equals all this, or 4x equals all this. And we now have to solve for x. Solve for x. All right. In both of these equations, these cases, how do we solve for x? In both equations, we divide both sides by four. Now on the right side, instead of thinking of dividing by four, I mean, <laughs> instead of thinking of dividing by four, we might want to think about multiplying by what number? Dividing by four is equivalent to multiplying by what number? Multiplying by the reciprocal, namely one fourth. So when dividing the right-hand side by 4, it may actually be more convenient to thinking, think of it as multiplying the right side by 1 fourth. All right. Now, in my notes, uh, I actually do divide uh, all the terms on the right sides by 4. Uh, but again, it might be more convenient to think of multiplying by 1 fourth. So over here, 4x divided by 4 is x. That's fine, all right? But what's all this divided by four? It might be easier to think of it as what is one fourth times four pi over three? When you take four pi over three and divide by four, you're really multiplying by one fourth. And then what happens? Goodbye. We have ones left up here and down here. We're left with pi over three. Pi over three plus, well, two fourths is one half. So two pi over four, is pi over 2 times n. You could write this as pi n all over 2. Uh, as it turns out, uh, partly for theory purposes, uh, I'm going to pop the n out. But if you want to leave the n up on top, that's fine. All right. Over here, in case 2, again, we divide both sides by 4. On the left, it's easy. 4s becomes x once again. 
But on the right-hand side, again, we might want to consider multiplying by one-fourth. One-fourth times five pi over three, which is easier to think of than, than this. <laughs> one-fourth times five pi over three. We don't get any cross cancellations or anything. We just multiply across. We get five pi over 12 over here, five pi over 12. Plus, and we have the same last term over here. We get pi over two n. We start off with two pi n in both cases. We end up with pi over two n in both cases, where n is integer. At the very least, put this at the very end. Technically, I should carry it through here, but remind me at some point. So finally, in fact, we could put this over here. <laughs> finally, have our solution set. All right, our general solution set for the general equation, meaning that I'm solving over all reals. Uh, the, the solution set is the set of all x in the reals, such that x is of the form pi over three plus pi over two n, or x is of the form five pi over 12 plus pi over two n, where n is integer. So that's my general solution. It's the set of all real solutions for this top equation over here. Now a natural follow-up example would ask, what are the solutions for this equation between zero and two pi? in this interval from zero to two pi. Believe it or not, that's actually a much harder question for students. And in fact, even if I were to ask this right off the bat, my suggestion is to find the general solution first. I advise that you find this general solution first anyway. So whether I ask for all real solutions or just the solutions between zero to two pi, I advise that you find this general solution set first. In the next video, we're going to find the solutions between zero and two pi. And we're going to find out why it's actually more work. And in fact, we're going to need to build off of our answer to this first part. Now, first of all, uh, are there any questions about that first part? Because we're going to use this to answer this second part. Questions, questions. Okay, feel free to ask questions in chat. All right. Okay, let's go on. That's in the next video. Hi everyone. We're going back to the equation we solved last time. Two sine of four x equals negative root three. Before, we solved it over all real numbers and we got all real solutions. It was represented by this general solution set over here. The set of all x in the reals such that x was a member of this first group, I'll call group one, or x is a member of this second group, which I'll call group two, where n is an integer. You should write that. Okay, now believe it or not, the harder problem is finding solutions specifically in this interval, in part because I advise that you, that you find the general solution first anyway. So whether I ask you to find all real solutions or the solutions only in this interval or some other interval, I advise you find the general solution set first anyway. And then there's more work to get what these particular angles, solutions are going to be in that interval. And it turns out we have many particular solutions in this interval. All right, let's go through these two groups. Now, one way you can do this is by plugging in various integer values for n, but we can make things a bit more efficient and systematic. All right. We're going to use the idea of incrementing, and it comes from basically the distributive property. So here's the idea. Uh, if we start with n equals zero, and we will, then we cover this term up and we're left with pi over three. So pi over three will be a particular solution in this interval. But then we're going to let n equal one, two, and so forth. We'll see how far we have to go before we hit two pi or beyond. But uh, instead of plugging in n equals one, n equals two, and so forth, which you could do, here's the idea. Let's say that we increase the value of n by one. So we go from n 
to the quantity n plus one. We go from n to the quantity n plus one. Now, if we substitute n plus one for n over here, what happens? The pi over two can distribute through this and we get pi over two n plus pi over two. So again, I'll write that out. If you replace n plus one into the end here, if you have pi over two, all times not n, but the quantity n plus one, when you distribute, what do you get? You get pi over two n, like what we have here, but you get another piece, plus pi over two times one, plus pi over two, which is an additional piece. So what's the point I'm making here? Every time you increase the value of n by one, that's like an incrementing. Every time you increase the value of n by one, for example, let's say you go to the next integer from zero to one, from one to two, and so forth then basically you're adding pi over two to this right-hand side. You're adding the coefficient pi over two here to the right-hand side. Same for over here. So let's apply this principle. We're going to start with pi over three and we're going to keep adding pi over two until we get into trouble here. All right. Group one. Remember group one consisted of these solutions. These were all the real solutions uh, that corresponded to uh, what came from this point over here. And then remember, we had to divide by four. We'll talk about that. We basically take this and divide by four. All right, group one. We could plug in n equals zero, one, and so forth, but let's do it faster. All right, now when n equals zero, this term dies out and we're just left with pi over three. And pi over three is in, this, in the uh, interval we want from zero to two pi. And then we're going to increment, we're going to keep adding, or if necessary, subtract by pi over two. We're gonna start with pi over three and we're going to keep adding, and if necessary, subtract by pi over two to get more solutions in this interval. But the problem is that we need a common denominator. And right off the bat, you see why this, this problem is already harder than the previous problem, where I wanted all real solutions, because we're dealing with all these fractions and denominators and all this. And we have to add these unlike fractions, which we didn't really have to do before. All right, let's get these in terms of six, because six is the LCD, if we're dealing with thirds and halves. All right. So how do we get from pi over three to six? Well, three times what is six? Three times two is six. So we multiply the top by two. Pi times two is two pi. Pi over three times two over two is two pi over six. That's how we build up that fraction. For pi over two, we're multiplying by basically three over three, which is a form for one. We're multiplying by one really. Pi over two times three over three we get three pi over six. Pi over two times the three pi over three, three over gets three. us three pi over six. All right. So how are we going to do this? And again, you could just plug in values for n, but let's do this. We're going to start with pi over three, which is simplified. And in fact, I'll box it in, in red that is going to be one of our final solutions in the solution set. All right, now the thing is we're going to keep adding pi over two. So for now, it's easier for us to reinterpret pi over three as two pi over six, and we're going to keep adding. One reason why I call this the increment is that this is meant to have you recall Picapia from before. Remember in Picapia, the hardest part about a Picapia problem was finding the x or theta coordinates, right? I had to get from uh, the phase shift, or zero maybe, to here, and then to here, and then to here, and then to here. And we use the idea of an increment, a thing that we add to get to each new coordinate for these grid lines. Well, similarly, we're going to start with two pi over six, and we're going to keep adding pi over two in the form of three pi over six. So we're going to start with two pi over six, and we're going to keep adding three pi over six. All right, 
now before we even talk about adding, we can even ask ourselves as a thought experiment, what's two pi over six minus three pi over six? Do we get anything good? Well, two pi over six minus three pi over six, that's negative pi over six. Ah, that's no good. That's too low. That's outside of this interval. And in general, uh, if back over here, if you pick the least non-negative representative for this point, in this case, four pi over three, then you shouldn't have to do any subtracting. Okay, but we're just playing it safe. All right, so don't subtract. We add two pi over six plus three pi over six. So we go in the right direction. Two pi over six plus three pi over six gets us another solution, five pi over six. And notice this is simplified, so I'll box it in. In fact, on an exam, I might even accept it if students just box in all of their solutions. Though technically, remember that an answer to a solvent equation problem should really be a solution set. But in the meantime, let's box these in. Now, what's five pi over six plus three pi over six? That's eight pi over six, but we need to simplify that. That simplifies to four pi over three. All right. Now, uh, for addition purposes, let's go back to eight pi over six. We're thinking in terms of six when we're adding the increment. What's eight pi over six? Again, plus three pi over, whoops, again, plus three pi over six, 11 pi over six, which is simplified. By the way, it so happens these are famous angles. Uh, well, these don't have to be famous. It's possible that in other problems, you might get pi over 24 or something like that. So we're just kind of lucky that these happen to be special angles. Now notice 11 pi over six, that's knocking on the door of two pi. 11 pi over six is just barely below two pi. So I think we're done, but just to be safe, let's think about it. What's 11 pi over six plus three pi over six? That's going to be 14 pi over six or seven pi over three. Ah, nope. That's too big. Seven pi over three is bigger than two pi. That's not going to be a solution that we want now. So we cross that out. So these are the only four particular solutions we get from group one that are in this interval from zero to two pi. And by the way, if we were to get two pi, we would eliminate it because of this parenthesis over here. Uh, two pi is coterminal with zero. So if zero is a solution, we usually don't want two pi also. All right, uh, now you might be asking, the fact that we have four solutions in here, uh, is that a coincidence? Well, not quite. Remember, in the original equation, uh, we had two sine of four x equals negative root three. Uh, or you can look at it this way. We're looking at this equivalent equation, sine of four x equals negative root three over two. In fact, I'd like to focus more on this equation. Now, the fact that we have four solutions in group one, that's not a coincidence. The fact that there's a four there in front of, an, in front of the x, that does have an impact. So the fact that we have a four x here, yes, uh, that is related to the fact that we have four solutions from group one. However, I don't want to make a blanket statement uh, because if you're dealing with quadrantal angles, for example, or if using symmetry, then that might not be a be the case. So uh, I don't want to say that just because four is in front of x, that's going to be the number of solutions you get in any given group, because it depends how you're using symmetry. It depends if you're dealing with quadrantal angles. So I'm not ready to set that in stone. I will just say for now, because we're dealing with sine of four x, it is not a coincidence that we happen to have, well, it's not a coincidence that we have four solutions in group one. By the way, we could have obtained these by plugging in n equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. But again, uh, even though you might guess that these are the four appropriate values of n to plug in, it's not ironclad. So you should go through these one by one. But it is true that these four values of n will get us these four particular solutions in group one that we want. You could have guessed at that, but to be extra sure, we went through these one by one. Because remember, if you're using certain symmetries or if you're dealing with quadrantal angles, then it might not be four solutions. For example, you might be dealing with tangent or cotangent. That has a different period. 
All right. Anyway, we're not done yet. That was just group one. What about group two? Although in group two, I have less uh, blabbing to do, right? And it turns out we don't have to simplify much. Here, we're going to start with 5 pi over 12. Okay. The increment, again, is going to be pi over 2, the coefficient on n. But we want that in terms of 12s. Pi over 2 times 6 over 6. Pi over 2 times 1 in the form of 6 over 6 gets us 6 pi over 12. So we're going to start with 5 pi over 12, and we're going to keep adding 6 pi over 12. Now, again, 5 pi over 6, I'm, I'm sorry, 5 pi over 3 was our smallest non-negative representative for this point over here. So it turns out we won't have to subtract. Uh, actually, I'm now explaining why it is we picked 5 pi over 3 as our representative for this point, because many students may have picked negative pi over 3. In fact, if I had just wanted the general solution on R, negative pi over 3 might have given us a more efficient solution set. But if we eventually want to find solutions between 0 and 2 pi, it's actually better for us to take the least non-negative representative for this point. So the 5 pi over 3 turns out to be better than negative pi over 3 if we ultimately want to find solutions in this interval. Okay. So 5 pi over 3, that's our least non-negative solution, which means that when we deal with 5 pi over 12, we shouldn't have to subtract. And we don't have to. Uh, you can see here that 5 pi over 12 minus 6 pi over 12, that's no good. That's going to be negative pi over 12. That's outside the interval from 0 to 2 pi. I'm going to blue now. We still only want particular solutions between 0 and 2 pi. All right. Well, here they are. Uh, and they're simplified as we go along. 5 pi over 12 plus 6 pi over 12 is 11 pi over 12, simplified. 11 pi over 12 plus 6 pi over 12 is 17 pi over 12, that's simplified. And 17 pi over 12 plus 23 pi over 12, simplified. We get our four solutions from group four. Uh, this last one is very, very close to 2 pi. If you try to add again 6 pi over 12, you're going to go over. So once again, we only have four solutions in group two. Again, it's not a coincidence that we had sine of 4x in our original equation. So it's no coincidence that we have four solutions in group two, but still, it's better to be sure. But if you had to guess, uh, you might guess that you would need to plug in n equals 0, 1, 2, and 3, these four values for n. And if you make that guess, you'd be right. However, if you try to plug in directly, it might be harder for you to do it one by one. It might take more time. I think this incrementing technique is faster. Start with 5 pi over 12. You don't have to subtract. Keep adding. And then don't add from here. You're going to go over. So finally, we get eight solutions when we, when we, get, uh, when we gather together the four solutions from group one and the four solutions from group two. Here, I did not sort them. I did not order them. If you want, you can put them in order. Uh, it would be uh, pi over 3 first, and then 5 pi over 12, then 5 pi over 6, then 11 pi over 12. If you wish, you can sort these, but you don't have to. Uh, sets are unordered, and I would accept the solution set. In fact, on an exam, I might have been happy if you just boxed these eight values in. <laughs> but uh, remember, the answer to a solving equation problem is technically a solution set. If you want to sort or order these, great, but you don't even have to do that. And these are all the real values of x in the interval from 0 to 2 pi that will solve this equation up here. In the next video, I'm going to discuss, discuss Desmos, and I'm going to discuss the relationship between theta and x in the next video. Uh, any questions? That's a lot. Uh, this, is the, this is one of the harder, more complicated problems uh, in this homework set. Although it is systematic. If you're careful, you can do it. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, again, Desmos can give you some intuition. And, and knowing the difference between theta and x. Theta is 4x, remember. Last video before the break, I think. Hi, everyone. I'd now like to do an overview of our work on this equation. 
which we solved on all reals and also on the interval from zero to two pi. Now, when we were finding the general solution to begin with, uh, it was very helpful to substitute theta for four x. So then we're just dealing with sine of theta equals negative root three over two, which is a good old school problem. Solve that for theta. Uh, we found solutions in quadrants three and four. Uh, now, for quadrant four, you might have preferred negative pi over three as a representative for that point, but since we're eventually going to solve for the angles uh, for solutions between zero and two pi, uh, actually pi, pi over three is nicer. See, if you had picked neg uh, negative pi over three, then in the, in the later phase of the problem, when looking for solutions between zero and two pi, then after dividing by four, then in group two, you would have started with negative pi over 12 here, and then you would have had to reject that right off the bat, and then add pi over two to get your first solution, which is fine, you can do that. Uh, you could have started with uh, negative pi over 12 as your first solution for x, reject that, and then add six pi over 12 to get your first legitimate solution, pi pi over 12. So anyway, uh, that's why we picked five pi over three as our representative for this point here. Although negative pi over three might have been more convenient if you just cared about the general solution on R, all reals. But basically this was a pretty generic problem and our solution set for theta essentially looked like that. Theta equals four pi over three, also the coterminal twins, or theta equals five pi over three, also the coterminal twins. If you were to use Desmos, uh, here's the graph of y equals sine of theta, where the horizontal axis here is the theta axis. It's our sine wave. And where does sine of theta equal negative root three over two? For what values of theta? Well, we look at the theta coordinates of the intersection points. Over here, we see uh, four pi over three, right? That was our quadrant three rep over here. We see Theta equals five pi over three also gives us an intersection point between the red and blue graphs. Five pi over three here is a solution for theta. We could have picked negative pi over three, but we just had to worry about one rep in quadrant three and one rep in quadrant four. So these were fine. Basically representatives for these two points between zero and two pi, between theta equals zero and theta equals two pi four pi over three and five pi over three. But then we want to consider all the coterminal twins. Now you might be asking, well, since we're dealing with sine of four X, uh, can't we just deal with four reps for this point and four reps for that point? Actually, that's the approach that Ron Larson takes. Uh, many of my notes are based on Ron Larson's textbooks. Uh, so Ron Larson might say, okay, uh, take the four pi over three, okay add zero, take the four pi over three, then add two pi, add four pi, and add six pi. Take the results of these sums, divide by four, and then you'll get the four solutions in group one, when we get the solutions for x between zero and two pi. Uh, but uh, even though Ron Larson is normally clear, I don't think he's too clear in this respect. Uh, and in fact, if you use symmetry, or if you're dealing with tangent or cotangent, or if you're dealing with uh, quadrantal angles, then uh, it may not be clear what you need to add by and how to exactly work it out. So I think my method is actually better and clearer. Okay, so uh, we have all real solutions for theta right here. Four pi over three plus two pi n, or theta equals five pi over three plus two pi n, where n can be any integer. Now, how do the solutions for x compare, right? Well, again, you can imagine all these solutions, line them up, divide all these by four, and pick the ones that are between zero and two pi. Uh, so that's sort of the philosophy behind what Ron Larson is doing. But operationally, step by step, I think my process is clearer. All right. So what do we do? We replace theta with four x. We do our division by four, and we get this as our general solution set for x. All right. So now we're graphing y equals sine. So now we're considering 
the original equation, right? And we're considering x. So where, for what values of x does sine of 4x equal negative root 3 over 2? How does the graph of y equals sine of 4x differ from the graph of y equals sine of x or theta? It's a squeezed in graph. We get four cycles where we normally have one between 0 and 2 pi. So then we don't get two solutions between 0 and 2 pi like we did for theta. We get four times as many. We get eight solutions. And where are they? At pi over 3, 5 pi over 12, and so forth. We get these eight, well, let's put them all out. We get these eight solution values for x. These eight. <laughs> these eight, from pi over 3 all the way up to 23 pi over 12. These eight x coordinates for these eight intersection points between x equals 0 and x equals 2 pi. And these eight solutions are the ones that form our ultimate solution set over here. The four from group one are the ones uh, on the, on the uh, downswing. So four pi over three went to pi over three, okay, and also five pi over 12 and two others. Oh, okay, wait, wait. Uh, so pi over three, hold on, not five pi over 12, sorry. It's pi over three and then the five pi over six is over here. So here's pi over three over here. Here's five pi over six over here. Okay, so pi over three, five pi over six, four pi over three, so pi over three over here, five pi over six, five, uh, four pi over three is hidden here. Okay, and then 11 pi over six. All right, these were the guys on the downswing, on the downswing. And all four of these guys came from group one. They ultimately came from, whoops, this, uh, this spider egg over here. So on the unit circle, if you were to look at our eight solutions on the unit circle, our solutions for x, we have a lot of them. It's quite a mess. So our purple solutions for x in group one, all right, they corresponded, I should have put this in purple. They came from this purple spider egg for theta. Remember, these are our solutions for theta. Four pi over three plus two pi n, also five pi over three plus two pi n. These four purple spiders came from this purple spider egg I'll actually color them in purple. <laughs> this purple spider egg in quadrant three. Whereas these red spiders, these four red spiders, come from this red spider egg in quadrant four. Notice if you look at the solution set, the ones from the purple spider egg in quadrant three for theta, so the, the quadrant three spider egg for theta gave us these four solutions for x Oops. in purple. These four spider eggs for x. And then this red spider egg for theta in quadrant four ended up giving, giving us these four spiders for x in group two. Notice uh, the purple spiders, sorry, the purple eggs over here, the purple egg over here is less than the red egg over here. So that leads to the fact that uh, this purple spider is less than this red spider, and so forth. So the group one angles are a bit less than the group two angles. So again, the two solutions for theta, remember we just had two solutions for theta at four pi over three and five pi over three, all right? Imagine the spider eggs here. So we consider their, co their coterminal twins. When the spider eggs break up, okay, the purple egg gave us these four purple spiders, these x coordinates, whereas the red egg for theta in quadrant four gave us these guys on the upswing. Uh, I would have played a clip from the film Arachnophobia with Jeff Daniels and John Goodman. But the idea is that these big spider eggs for theta, each of them breaks up into four spiders for x. So these two eggs here give us eight spiders over here, corresponding to the eight intersection points, the, x, the eight x coordinates for the eight intersection points between the purple and blue graphs. One, two, three. 
four, five, six, seven, eight. From pi over three to 23 pi over 12. More on solving trig equations next time. Uh, and by the way, I noticed that the, uh, the purple spiders are a bit less than the red spiders. See that? Purple less than red and so forth. So before we take a break, uh, I just mentioned the idea of spider eggs and arachnophobia. Well, I know how to pause recordings now, right? I want to play a little clip in case some of you haven't heard. All right, any questions? Any questions? Uh, feel free to put questions in chat. Okay, we have a bit more solving equations, then we're going to hit the identities. Uh, remember, I do have a kind of handout thing in both my notes, and I think it's separate also on my website. All right, so let's go on. A quick experiment before we go on. When we solved basically sine of 4x equals negative root 3 over 2, and we made theta equal to 4x, the two spider eggs for theta gave eight spiders for x. The purple spider egg for theta gave four purple spiders for x. And the red spider egg for theta gave us four spiders for x. Eight solutions total. But what if instead of 4x, we had 5x? So between sine of 4x and negative root 3 over 2, there were eight intersection points. The x coordinates were the solutions. What if we made the four of five? How many solutions will we get then? For sine of five x equals this number. 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Between zero and two pi. 10 solutions between zero and two pi. What, what about sine of six x? We get 12 solutions. What about sine of 10 x? We get 20 solutions. 10 in group one, 10 in group two. Play with Desmos, you'll learn a lot. Okay, so that was a little uh, extra bit, all right? Then our final major bit from this section. Hi everyone, we're going to finish up 5.3 by using some notation that we haven't seen in a while. Let's solve this equation. Three sine of x minus one equals zero, and we want to find all real solutions. We're solving this on R. Well, this is a linear form in sine of x. We can isolate sine of x itself. Add one to both sides, divide by three, not a problem. To isolate sine of x, add one to both sides, divide by three, and we get sine of x equals one-third. Now you agree, one-third is a legitimate sine value. It's between negative one and one. So the solution set will not be the empty set. We will get real solutions. And in what quadrants will the solutions be in? In what two quadrants will sine of x be positive in value? Think y or vertical coordinate on the unit circle. Well, we're going to have solutions in quadrant one and in quadrant two. Let's say I want to have exact names for these solutions. I don't just want decimal approximations. Or even if I wanted approximations, how could I figure these things out on my calculator? Well, it might help to have a reference angle. And the reference angle will be a solution. What is the acute angle in quadrant one where the y coordinate here, the sine value, is one third? I need to draw this circle a bit better. There we go. <laughs> All right, so what is this angle? What is this acute angle whose sine value is one third? What can we name it? The reference angle here, the acute angle. X equals what? The what of one third? The what of one third? Remember? Arc sign or inverse sign more cleanly over here. The best representative for this point here in quadrant one is the reference angle, the acute angle, arc sine of one third. His brother over here, what's the best representative for this brother point over here in quadrant two? Well, pi minus the reference angle. 
these guys have the same reference angle. Okay, here's arc sine of one third. Okay, it's the same reference angle, arc sine of one third in blue here, in blue here. So to get this angle over here, we do pi radians for half a revolution. Pi radians for half a revolution, and then we backtrack. We go clockwise by the reference angle, which is this acute angle. Pi minus arc sine of one third. And since, okay, so now these are the two solutions between zero and two pi, by the way. If we just wanted the two solutions between zero and two pi, then it would just, it would just be these two guys over here. This and this. But if we want all real solutions, we also have, we also have to do our plus two pi n jazz to get all the coterminal twins. So our solution set can be written like this or like this. And there are other ways of writing it. The set of all x values in the reals, such that x is of the form arc sine of one third or inverse sine of one third, same thing, plus two pi n, because we want all the coterminal twins, where n is integer, or x is of the form pi minus arc sine of one third, or x equals pi minus inverse sine of one third, plus two pi n. We want all the coterminal twins, where n is integer. This inverse trig notation, or we could write arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent. We needed that because one third, although it was a legitimate sine value, it was not a special sine value. Okay, so the so we couldn't get a reference angle like pi over three or pi over five or something like that. The best we could do for description was the inverse sine or arc sine of one third for our reference angle, and you could round that off using a calculator if we want uh, rounded off approximations. For G, using inverse functions and the corresponding notation. When you're finding reference angles, you're, you're kind of applying the idea of inverse functions anyway, but sometimes we actually need the inverse sine or arc sine notation, uh, especially if we're on a part of an exam where we're not allowed to use our calculators, uh, if we have to give exact expressions for our solutions. Uh, bear in mind, if you're allowed to use calculators, you may have to round these off anyway. Next up, 19 more identities you have to know. Next. Uh, yeah, seriously. Okay, so this wraps up section 5.3 on trig equations. It's a major section. Um, in fact, I could argue that if there's one section I would give, if, if I had to give one final exam question, it might be a 5.3 question, how to solve a trig equation. All right, questions before we go on. Questions. All right. I try to keep you in suspense what the title was. <laughs> Identities next. Hi everyone. Sections 5.4 and 5.5 will cover a bunch more trig identities. I'm going to require you to know or figure out 19 and be able to use eight more. So 19 plus eight, 27 total. So I have a separate handout. You can get it off my website also. And we're, and we're going to go over it. <laughs> uh, but here's the overall schematic. I'm going to start with the three sum identities. I'm not going to prove these two on top, but um, you, I'm going to start with the overall sum identities, numbers one through three. Although sometimes the difference identities are proven first in books. Uh, now we're going to go through how you can get from these lowly sum identities, you can get all these other identities. In fact, one of my best math students of all time uh, told me that she didn't have a very good memory but she was able to memorize the three sum identities and she was able to figure out all the others. This is a great exercise during a commercial break or maybe during the news. Start with the three sum identities and derive the other 16. These eight over here, again, uh, be prepared to use them when you see them. All right, let's start by introducing the three sum identities. And in principle, you use algebra and basic trig identities to go from there. All right, things that you need to memorize. At the very least, you have to memorize the three sum identities, and then you can go from there. So, the sine of u plus v. What is the sum identity for the sine function? It is not 
Don't engage in wishful thinking. It is not sine of u plus sine of v. It does not break up like that. Square roots don't work like that. Logs don't work like that. Sine and cosine don't work like that either. You do not break things up like that. Instead, and again, this comes from proofs, which we won't go over, but this comes from the sum of the mixed up products. That, well, that's a way to think about the right-hand side. The sum of the mixed up products. Again, parentheses might help. The sine of u plus v is sine of u, cosine of v, plus cosine of u, sine of v is the sum of the mixed up products. It's a real tossed salad here, right? So it's all mixed up. Now, by the way, uh, if your u and your v tend to look alike, then maybe when you're applying the identities, you might prefer a and b, or maybe x and y, assuming these two don't look too much alike. Uh, but if your u and your v look too much alike, then maybe you might prefer one of these other, one of these other pairs, and then sub back if necessary. Actually, one reason why I chose u and v is that often we substitute into u and v, like when we're dealing with uh, known angles, like 30 degrees. Anyway, think of sine of u plus v not like this up here, but as the sum of the mixed up products. Cosine of u plus v, I'll put it in blue, cosine of u plus v, again, not cosine of u plus cosine of v, the sum identity here, think cosine product minus the sine product. Cosine of u times cosine of v, the product of these cosine values, minus sine of u sine of v, minus the product of these sine values. If you remember the cosines minus the sines, you should probably remember this, or maybe the cosine product minus the sine product. Tangent of u plus v in green. Tangent of u plus v. Now, this is hard to memorize. Uh, I think of it as the sum over 1 minus the product. By the sum, I mean tangent of u plus tangent of v over 1 minus the product, tangent of u times tangent of v. So these are our three sum identities that you should memorize, maybe with these mnemonic devices. And from these, we can get all the others. Be prepared to apply these identities both left to right, like you're expanding, and also right to left, like you're condensing. And we're going to apply these identities in both directions. So now, let's go from the sum identities to the difference identities. And these will be numbers four through six. Now, in terms of memorization, it's very straightforward. Here are the sum identities. Here are the difference identities. Look familiar? Basically, you take the sum identities, and there's a trick. You change every sign in sight. You flip every visible sign. You flip every visible sign. So every sign in sight, the plus signs here go to minus signs because we're doing difference identities now. The plus sign from before becomes a minus sign now. The minus before, remember that uh, the sum identity for cosine had a minus in here. Uh, that's important because that helps explain why the derivative of cosine of x is negative or the opposite of sine of x. It's that minus sign there. Some of you who have taken calculus know that fact. The derivative of cosine of x is the opposite of or negative sine of x is because of that minus sign. The minus sign turns to a plus sign here. Likewise, for the sum identity for tangent, the plus and the minus go to a minus and a plus. You flip all the visible signs. I say that you flip every visible sign because uh, there is an implied plus sign in the front, here, here, and 
here. Uh, but you don't flip those to minuses. These don't flip to minuses. So you flip every visible sign, every sign you see, plus or minus, even on the left-hand side. And why does this trick work? It almost seems like magic. It's magically convenient. Why does this trick work? So it, I can actually prove or derive these from the sum identities. So for example, okay, uh, why does the sine of u minus v equal this? All right, well the sum identity for sine is in red up here. Sine of u plus v is the sum, the sum of the mixed up products with a plus sign in the middle. Now to analyze sine of u minus v, here's the idea. We're taking sine of u plus v and we're placing v with its opposite. We're substituting v with its opposite. And of course, u plus the opposite of v is just u minus v. So these are equivalent. We're going to apply the sum identity where we're taking the sine of the sum of u and the opposite of v. So every time we had a v up here, we're going to replace with the opposite of v. Now, is cosine even or odd? Is cosine even or odd? Cosine is even. So it's these guys again. Cosine is even. Which means, what happens to this negative sign or opposite sign in here? It dies. We can delete it. It drops out. Cosine of opposite of V is just cosine of V. But what about sine, S-I-N-E? Sine is what kind of function, even or odd? Sine is odd. So what happens to this negative or opposite sign? It pops out. So over here, this sine dies out because cosine is even, but this guy pops out because the sine function, S-I-N-E, is odd. So the plus sign turns to a minus sign. It comes down to the even and odd properties. Cosine is even, while sine and also tangent are odd. Look at cosine. Here's the sum identity for cosine. If you replace V with its opposite, again, cosine doesn't care. That sine dies out, but sine cares that negative sign would pop out, make that a plus. Over here, tangent of u plus v. Tangent is odd. If you replace v with the opposite, tangent cares, this negative sign pops out. Uh, tangent cares, we have negative v here. The negative sign pops out, makes that a plus. We're not changing the u here, or tangent of u. But when the v's go to their opposites, then tangent of v will go to their opposites. So we flip these signs. So the reason why we flip all the visible signs to get from the sum identities to the difference identities is because of the even-odd properties. Cosine is even, while sine and tangent are odd. So we now have six. Memorize these three, the sum identities, then you can quickly get these additional three, the difference identities. We're up to six. Also, we're going to see in the next video how the sum identities will lead to the double angle identities. And that'll give us not three more, but eventually five more. Next time. Okay, any questions? We're gonna end up with 19 plus eight. <laughs> any questions? All right, good to go over these. Hi everyone, we're continuing with these new trig identities, starting with the three sum identities. Now, uh, this was a favorite meme of mine early on, back in chapter zero, uh, looking at the bottom two panels, pointing out the square of a plus b is not a squared plus b squared. The square of a sum is not the sum of squares. That makes teacher mad, hopefully not this mad. Uh, I once had a student wonder if that was blood over there. No, that's a cloud, not blood, please. <laughs> but. Remember, the square of a sum is not the sum of squares. Squares do not distribute over sums. The same is true for sine, cosine, and tangent. Uh, the sine of u plus v is not sine of u plus sine of v, right? So uh, sine and cosine and tangent, uh, they don't, in a sense, distribute over sums. Uh, the cosine of a sum is not the sum of cosines. The tangent of a sum is not the sum of tangents. 
all right? So uh, these bottom two panels help remind us of that. So the sum identities are more complicated, right? Like sine of u plus v, that's the sum of the mixed up products. I'm going to come back to this meme in particular in just a moment. Back to the main schematic. So we have these three sum identities. Uh, we had ways of memorizing those. And from those, we got the three difference identities from flipping all the visible signs. In fact, I can write that, type that in small text. Okay, so we flip all visible signs to get from sum to difference. Now, uh, to get from the sum identities to the double angle identities, number seven through nine at least, we're going to apply a trick. Now, eventually, we're actually going to get five double angle identities. There are actually five of these because there are three for cosine. We'll deal with those later. For right now, let's get to the three primary double angle identities, identities numbers seven, eight, and nine. Now, of course, I, I'm not going to... Uh, number these all the time. You don't have to memorize these numbers. I'm just being cute here. We're going to end up with 19 <laughs> down here. All right. What are numbers 7, 8, and 9? So the double angle identities. How do we get the sine of 2u? How do we get the sine of 2u? What is the double angle identity? What is the double angle identity for the sine function? What's an expression for sine of 2u, where we no longer have a 2 inside the argument? OK. Now, sine of 2u, how does that break up? Well, we can use the sum identity for sine, because what is 2u? If you ask the, an algebra student, hey, what's 2u? A good algebra student would say, well, 2u is u plus u. So we can basically apply the sum identity where v equals u. So in the overall schematic, uh, whoops, in the overall schematic up here, to get from the sum identities to these three double angle identities, the main ones, the key trick we're going to use is that we're going to let v equal u. Let v equal u. And we can derive these. All right. Again, the sum identity for sine is to sum the mixed up products. Although since v equals u, they're not so mixed up. Sine of u, cosine of u, plus cosine of u, sine of u. In fact, take a look at these two terms. If you do a snap substitution, this basically looks like xy plus yx. These two terms are like these, these are like terms. These are like terms. Well, back here, how can you simplify xy plus yx? Well, xy plus yx is, is equivalent to xy plus xy because multiplication is commutative. And what is xy plus xy? It's twice xy, 2xy. Right. Kind of like uh, on this meme, what's a plus a? 2a. What's apple plus apple? 2 apple. What's xy plus xy? It's 2xy. What's this term plus this term? These are equivalent terms. You can actually show that. <laughs> They're equivalent terms. 2 sine of u, cosine of u. So sine of 2u can be written as 2 sine of u, cosine of u. And that can be helpful sometimes. Sometimes that 2 gets irritating. Maybe you have an expression where you're dividing this by sine of u or cosine of u, and then you can simplify. All right, so sine of 2u is 2 sine of u cosine of u. The way that I remember this is that it's twice the product. I think twice the product. And that's a reminder. It's 2 sine of u cosine of u. A common error is for students to just pop out the two and go home. Uh, it's not just two sine of u, you also need the cosine of u. It's twice the product. Twice sine of u times cosine of u. All right. 
What about the double angle identity, the primary double angle identity for cosine? Cosine of 2u is cosine of u plus u again. So again, we're letting v equal u in the sum identities. These match up. Sum identity for cosine. It's the cosine product minus the sine product. It's cosine of u, cosine of u, the cosine product minus the sine product. Sine of u, sine of u. Let's go back to this meme. What's a times a? It's a squared. What's cosine of u times itself? It's cosine squared of u. What's sine of u times itself? It's sine squared of u. So again, no way to remember this. You can still think of this as basically the cosines minus the sines. But here, they're squared. Cosine squared of u minus sine squared of u. Cosine of 2u equals cosine squared of u minus sine squared of u. We can call this identity number 8. So this is identity number 8. The one up here is number 7. Not that we really have to care. <laughs> Next up, tangent of 2u. And I have a really hard time memorizing this just from scratch. Uh, I really have to go through the sum identity for tangent. Tangent of 2u equals tangent of u plus u. I remember that the sum identity for tangent goes the sum over 1 minus the product. It's the sum over 1 minus the product. By sum, I mean tangent of u plus tangent of u, put that in blue, over 1 minus the product. By product, I mean tangent of u times tangent of u. I'll put this in green. All right, how can we simplify these? Let's go back to this valuable mean. What's a plus a? It's 2a. Tangent of u plus tangent of u is 2 tangent of u. Whereas on the bottom, what is a times a? a times a is a squared. What's tangent of u times tangent of u? It's tangent squared of u. And a lot of students mix these up. That's why I kept going back to that mean. A lot of students don't just forget about the, the fact that this does not equal this. Students forget that this equals this and that this equals this, and it's not switched. <laughs> a plus a is 2a. A times A is A squared. If you know that, then you should believe that we end up with this over here. Two tangent of U over one minus tangent squared of U. Again, I have a hard time memorizing that, but since I know the sum identity, I can get the uh, double angle identity pretty quickly. But make sure you don't switch these. So that's our number nine. So we have now these three basic double angle identities for sine, cosine, and tangent. But wait, I promised you two more double angle identities for cosine. There are a total of three double angle identities for cosine, and they're all useful, including number eight, which we just discussed. But we're going to discuss two more double angle identities for cosine. This won't take long, actually. So let's go back uh, to here. So here's our number eight. Cosine of 2u equals cosine squared of u minus sine squared of u. All right. Now let's say that we're doing something like uh, solving a trig equation. Maybe uh, we have cosine of 2u. We don't like the 2u. We want to break it up. But I don't like this mix of cosine squared of u and sine squared of u. I might just want this in terms of either cosine squared of u or just sine squared of u, and maybe constants. Well, what identity, what key identity can make one of these look more like the other? Mr. Pythagoras, consider the Pythagorean identity. I'm writing this here as cosine squared of u plus sine squared of u equals 1 in part because we're going to apply the Pythagorean identity, and also 
notice this, and this is something that confuses students. This may well confuse you on the homework. Remember that down here, cosine squared u plus sine squared u equals one, but cosine squared u minus sine squared of u is not one, it's cosine of two u. So the difference in the signs here, S I G N S plus versus minus makes all the difference. This is one. This up here is cosine of two u. Flipping the sign changes you from this to this. So watch your sign. With a plus sign, you get one. With a minus sign, you get cosine of two u. This will bite you in the homework. Anyway, we're going to apply the Pythagorean identity. See, this is even more confusing. We're going to apply the Pythagorean identity here to help rewrite this expression here. So how can we do that? There are three versions of the double angle identity for cosine of two u. Again, I don't care how you number them, but here's the original. I claim that we can get from here to both here, version two, and here, version three. So this was identity number eight, not that we care, but here was, here was identity number eight. In blue, this here will be identity number 10. We use nine for tangent of two u. Uh, 10 here, this is in blue, and this here is 11 in green. So by the time we do these, we'll have 11 in the tank. All right. How do we get from 8 to 10 and 11? Remember, 9 was for a tangent of 2u. All right. It's applying the Pythagorean identities. Let's go through it. How do we go from uh, version 1 to version 2? Version 1 to version 2. So from identity number 8 to identity number 10, actually. All right. Cosine squared of u is equal to one minus sine squared of u. That's a variation on the basic Pythagorean identity. Okay, well, what's one minus? I'll do a snap substitution. X minus X. What's one minus X minus X? One minus two X. In this case, one minus two sine squared of u. X was sine squared of u. How do we get version three or identity number 11? This time, we replace sine squared of u with one minus cosine squared of u. That's another variation on the basic Pythagorean identity. Distribute the negative one here. We get this here. In short, it's of the form x minus one plus x. x plus x is two x. Here, x is uh, cosine squared u. x is cosine squared u. So we get two x or two cosine squared u, and then the minus one. So in order to get from uh, this identity in red, number eight, to these identities, numbers 10 and 11, we're applying the basic Pythagorean identity in two different ways. Did I write that? Yeah, we're applying this basic Pythagorean identity in two different ways. One where we solve for sine squared u, another where we solve for cosine squared u. So if you solve this in terms of sine squared u, solve for this in terms of sine squared u, you get this. If you solve for this in terms of cosine squared of u, you get that down there. So it's from the Pythagorean identities. So to get the three for cosine, keep in mind the Pythagorean identities. Mr. Pythagoras, that gets us from eight to both 10 and 11, Mr. Pythagoras. I type Pythagorean, <laughs> Pythagorean identities. Well, we've done a lot so far. We've covered 11 identities so far. Three for sum, three for difference, three and then five for double angle because we have three of these identities for cosine. And in fact, we're going to use number 10 and the number 11, these over, these over here, to get the PRIs, the power reducing identities. That's another reason why we did this. Not just so that we could get the right side just in terms of one 
type of square trig function, but because we're going to use these two identities, numbers 10 and 11, to derive the PRIs, the power reducing identities, specifically from 10 and 11. And that's next time. The PRIs are really important, by the way. Uh, Maybe in some ways more important than the others we've done so far. Any questions? Any questions? And thank you for the downloads. Um, I, I don't. I, I can't assume I have permission to share them myself, but I don't know if if you know that I can get people's permission, that'd be great. All right. Okay. Let's go on. Hi everyone. We're now going to go from. Identities number 10 and 11, which are two specialized double angle identities for cosine, and we're going to get these PRIs, the power reducing identities. Uh, by the way, some books actually switch uh, the titles on these, try not to get confused by that, between the PRIs and half angle. I call these the power reducing identities because they have a key purpose of reducing the power on an expression. So in calculus, remember that calculus hates squares. Uh, calculus hates taking the derivative or an integral of a square, like the square of sine of u or the square of cosine of u or the square of tangent of u. Uh, so we might want to break this up. Now, these right-hand sides might look worse, but actually calculus loves these when it comes to taking derivatives or integrals, differentiation or integration. Okay. So how do we get these power-reducing identities, these PRIs? Uh, and again, they're power-reducing because on the left-hand side, we have squares. Uh, on the right-hand side, we don't have any squares. We do double the arguments, and in some ways, the expression gets more complicated, but at least we don't have squares. Calculus hates squares. When you're integrating, you're going to have to rewrite this as that. Uh, I suppose it's possible to go right to left, but it's much more common to go left to right. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, a nice way to memorize these, it's good to memorize that sine squared of u is 1 minus cosine of 2u all over 2, or you could break it up, break up the fraction term by term like that. Uh, how is the cosine squared of u identity different? There's only one difference. Is that plus sign? In fact, there's a cute little mnemonic I use. Uh, sin is bad. That is, sin is negative. That's kind of a theological comment, and it may not apply in Vegas in normal days, uh, but we often associate sign with the negative sign. And we're going to see that. Uh, very often when we're dealing with sign, there's a negative sign involved in the corresponding identity. Uh, whereas the cosine version, or in this case, the cosine square version, will have the plus sign. How can we get a PRI for tangent squared of u? Well, here's a variation on the quotient identity. Tangent squared of u is sine squared of u over cosine squared of u. So it's going to be this fraction over this fraction Basically, the little twos die out. You can multiply by 2 over 2, and the little twos die out, and you end up with the top of this guy over the top of this guy. 1 minus cosine of 2u over 1 plus cosine of 2u. Again, sin is bad. Sin is negative. You remember the minus sign is on the top, corresponding to this sine square guy. So these are ways of remembering the PRIs, the power-reducing identities. How do we get them? How do we derive them? Well, let's look at these derivations. We get them from these two special versions for the double angle identity for cosine, cosine of 2u. Remember, we applied the Pythagorean identity in different ways to get this and to get that. All right, so how do we derive the PRIs? So for example, uh, here is identity number 10. Identity number 10. Okay, uh, It was one of our specialized double angle identities for cosine. Cosine of 2u equals 1 minus 2 sine squared of u. 
Now we're going to solve for sine square root of u. So we can add two sine square root of u to both sides. At the same time, subtract cosine of 2u. So we have a minus sign over here. And then to solve for sine square root of u, divide by 2 on both sides. Sine square root of u equals this fraction over here. 1 minus cosine of 2u, all over 2. And then again, it's easy to remember that you flip from minus to plus to get the PRI for cosine squared u. If you do the work, it's, it's, it's even easier. You add 1. So, um, oh, yeah, here I switch sides. You add 1 to both sides, divide by 2. It's even more straightforward. It helps that uh, uh, the cosine guy is in front. And by the way, the idea that sin was bad, sin was negative, that, ha that helped even with number 10 and number 11. Remember that for number 10, the minus sign is in front of this 2 sine square root of u term. Whereas for number 11, this guy over here, uh, there was a plus sign basically in front of 2 cosine square root of u. So right there you can see how uh, we associate the sine version with a negative sign, the cosine version with a plus sign. The PRIs for sine squared of u, cosine squared u, and tangent squared of u. Because calculus hates squares, especially when you're taking integrals. When you're integrating, you rewrite these like these. Okay, next up. So we have now numbers 12, 13, and 14, right? Numbers 12, 13, and 14. This is number. 12 for sine square root of u, 13 for cosine square root of u, 14 for tangent square root of u, if you want to keep track. <laughs> so now from these, we're going to get five half-angle identities, and that's next time. We're up to 14. Okay, so I want you to feel comfortable with these, right? Get familiar with them, because you have to recognize these in calculus. Questions, questions. The PRIs, you're absolutely going to have to know. The double angles are also fairly common. And even the sum identities you use to develop derivatives. All right. Hi, everyone. Finally, we're going from the PRIs, the power reducing identities, to these five half angle identities. So we're going to get numbers 15 through 19. And this time, uh, unlike double angle, where we had three for cosine, this time, we're actually going to get three for tangent. There are three half angle identities for tangent. And if you have a rigorous calculus teacher down the line, you might run into these various versions. Okay, well here they are. And if anything, they might, it might be easier if you just derive these from the PRIs using your algebra. But here they are. Uh, for example, sine of half theta, or theta over two, is plus or minus First of all, before I forget, uh, you need to state that you have to choose the appropriate sign based on the, uh, the quadrant that theta over 2 is in. You have to pick the sign appropriately. So choose the sign appropriately. You technically have to make that note. So it helps to know what quadrant theta over 2 is, or maybe it's quadrantal. All right, so uh, here the plus or minus, it's not like in the quadratic formula where you just grab both. You actually have to choose which one to pick. Of course, when stating the general identity, we don't know yet, so leave it as a plus or minus here. The square root of, this is the first time we're seeing square root, really, uh, 1 minus, because remember, sin is bad, sin is negative, you have a minus sign there, cosine of theta, all over 2. And if this kind of smells like the PRI, it should. We're going to get this from the PRI. And again, uh, what's the half angle identity for cosine? There's only one difference. The minus here goes to a plus here. And if you're actually doing an evaluation, uh, you may get different signs over here. But for right now, generically, let's leave the plus or minus in there. But again, the plus sign here is different. Sin is bad, sin is negative. Cosine, we have the plus sign. And for tangent of half theta, 
Well, we have plus or minus the square root of, well, again, uh, we're taking the quotient. By the quotient identities, it's going to be this guy over this guy. Uh, again, we have a plus or minus deal, the square root of, and the twos basically knock each other out. So it's the top of the sine version, one minus cosine of theta, over the top of the cosine version, one plus cosine of theta. Again, it looks like the PRI for tangent. So that's how we get numbers. So this would be number 15, and then number 16, and then number 17. And then later on, I'll show you how to get number 18, which is where tangent of half theta equals this guy, and number 19, our last guy, where tangent of half theta also equals this guy, and there's no ambiguity in signs. We'll talk about that. Okay, now, uh, as I mentioned before, it might be easier to derive this directly from the PRI instead of memorizing this. How do we do that? Okay, so let's go down to the proof over here. All right, so here's a PRI. It's number 12, I guess. It's number 12. Right. Sine squared of u equals one, which sine? Sin is bad, sin is negative. That's a minus sign there. Cosine of two u all over two. But we now want uh, to replace u with theta over two, or half of theta. So I'll perform this substitution. U is half theta, so therefore, if you, if you solve for theta, theta is twice u. We have both these relationships. They're consistent. Okay, now, uh, so we have sine squared of, now, half theta, or theta over two. This equals one minus cosine of theta, because you're doubling this argument, half theta goes to theta, all over two. So we have, uh, when you apply the square root method, okay, remember, for the square root method, if x squared is 7, then x can be what? It can be plus or minus the square root of 7. Hence, plus or minus the square root of this over here. Again, it might be easier to perform this derivation. Know the PRI and perform this derivation where you have the substitution. Again, the choice between the signs will depend on what quadrant theta over two lies in, or maybe it's quadrantic. It's a similar deal for a cosine, right? I mean, cosine squared of u had a plus sign, so therefore you had a plus sign for the cosine version. And for tangent, you take the quotient. Okay, so 15, 16, and 17 should make sense. But now, how do you get from 17 to 18 and 19? Well, I'll talk about the verification of that in a later video maybe a later day, in fact. But right off the bat, let me ask you, if you're a tutor, how would you tell a student to, get, to go from here to either here or here? So just manipulating this expression, just mechanically, if you're a tutor, what would you tell a student to do to this ugly expression over here to get to these nicer expressions, number 18 and number 19? Ignore the trig details for now. We'll deal with that in a later video. Just purely brute force mechanically. Just in terms of writing things. What do you do to this expression to get either of these two guys? What are the four changes you make? And I'll give you a hint. Start by asking the following question. What is here that's missing in 18 and 19? What disappears as we go from number 17, the right-hand side, to these right-hand sides for number 18 and number 19? Uh, technically, these identities also have this as the left-hand side. These are the right-hand sides for these new identities. How do we get from here to here or here? First of all, what do we remove? We remove that plus minus symbol, right? So the sine of tangent of half theta will come out automatically from these formulas, assuming it's a real value, 
bear in mind, this could be undefined. Second, there's something else we remove. We remove that ugly square root radical. So we also remove that ugly square root radical. Those are two things we remove. Now, what about the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator? Well, we replace uh, either the numerator or the denominator with sine of theta. We replace either, we replace either uh, the top for 19 or the bottom for 18 with sine of theta. And then the other stays the same. Actually, come to think of it, it might be easier if I phrase it the other way, huh? <laughs> so maybe I, I should say this. Maybe I should make this number three. Keep either the numerator or denominator. <laughs> For number 18, we keep the top, the numerator. For number 19, we keep the bottom, the denominator. And then number four, then you replace the other piece. Replace the other. Okay. So if you keep the top, you replace the bottom with sine of theta. If you keep the bottom, then you replace the top with sine of theta. There you go. <laughs> so that might be an easier way of phrasing that. All right. Maybe I'll move these all up. So you remove plus or minus. There's no more sign ambiguity. Remove the radical. Okay. Keep one part, the top or the bottom, and change the other part to sine of theta. Okay, in the next video, I'm going to help explain how we get these. How do we get these? And that's going to be very related to some homework problems I had you do, like on verification back in 5.2. That's next time. But in the meantime, hey, we have the 19. And that, by the way, for these eight, it's a matter of when you see them, be able to use them. Okay, we'll get to that later. All right, we, we have time, so uh, I'm going to show you how to get from 17 to 18 and 19, or at least one of these. So some key hints here. Uh, and then uh, after today, well, if you're super brave, you can do the homework, but I'm going to do more homework type problems on 5455 five, five next time on election night. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, on the half angle identities, I'd like to show you why identity 17 leads, or how identity 17 leads to identity, say, 18. And then the reasoning is very similar for number 19. I want to show you why these make sense. All right. So over here, it's really kind of a verification problem. In fact, I could frame this as a verification problem on homework, which I've kind of done, and on exams. All right, so tangent of theta over two. Here's identity number 17 equals plus or minus, where you would have to choose a sign, by the way, of the square root of one minus cosine of theta over one plus cosine of theta. It's like the sine top over the cosine top. Sin is bad, sin is negative on top, minus. All right, so, What's our target? Uh, maybe I'll keep the target in mind here. We should keep the target in mind. Uh, our target is going to be one minus cosine of theta all over sine of theta. One over cosine of theta all over sine of theta. That's going to be our target. Now, here's the deal. We want to get one minus cosine of theta all alone on top. Right now he's under a radical. Well, here's a question for you. As long as there are no domain problems, the square root of x times what will give you x? Well, the square root of x times itself will give you x. Meaning that I'm inclined to multiply one minus cosine of theta by itself. So I force a square there and then the radical will basically remove the square, although, although there is a subtlety there. Okay, so that's a strategy. Now, some of you might be thinking, 
well, wait, if I want a one minus cosine of theta in the end, why not just square this thing? A lot of students are tempted to do that, but I have a question for you. Is x equivalent to x squared? Is it always true that x equals x squared? Uh, no, you can't always say that. In fact, it's usually not true. <laughs> x is usually not equal to its own square. You don't have the right to square this because you feel like it. However, we can multiply by one, right? This here is one that is legal. You can multiply by one in the form one minus cosine of theta over one minus cosine of theta itself inside the radicand. So on the top, we're getting the square of one minus cosine of theta. We're leading to a removal, right? There's kind of almost an inverse deal going on where we can remove the square with the radical on top. And what's happening on the bottom? Well, it's that algebra rule, right? So we have, uh, there's so much purple here. Let's go to, let's go to blue. <laughs> okay, let's go to blue. All right. Uh, what is x plus y times x minus y? Whoops. It's equal to x squared minus y squared. If I can type. <laughs> if you have x plus y and x minus y, their product is x squared minus y squared. All right. So on the bottom, we get the square of 1, which is 1, minus cosine squared theta. And hey, what is 1 minus cosine squared theta? Mr. Pythagoras says it's sine squared of theta. And you can see how uh, we're aiming for that target down there. So by multiplying by 1 minus cosine of theta over itself inside the radicand, we're accomplishing two things. We're setting up for the removal of the radical on top, and we're setting up for a sine deal, S-I-N-E deal, on the bottom because of Mr. Pythagoras. All right. Well, uh, this, we can basically uh, use an old algebra rule that says that A squared over B squared is the square of A over B. So we can bring the square on the outside. Okay. Uh, don't freak out too much about domain right now. Uh, so, okay, so we have the, the square on the outside by this rule, this algebra rule. And remind me, what's the square of x squared? Well, if x is non-negative, it is x. But in general, it's the absolute value of x, remember? For your a plus, <laughs> the square root of x squared is technically the absolute value of x. In blah notation, it's that. And the absolute value does break up across fractions. Okay, so, so we have this. Plus or minus the absolute value of 1 minus cosine of theta. That's on the top. All over the absolute value of sine of theta. But wait a minute, I claim that I actually don't need the absolute value on top. Why not? Well, look at the argument inside here. 1 minus cosine of theta. I'll type it out here. We're focusing on 1 minus cosine of theta. But wait a minute, if I have a dollar and you take away cosine of theta away from me, at most, you're taking away $1 from me, right? That's the highest value in this range, in this guy's range, one. So one minus something that's at most one, you agree that I, I, I'm either left with something or I have exactly zero left. I don't owe you money, even though you're my thief anyway. But uh, So one minus cosine of theta, you agree, this is non-negative for all real values of theta. And this kind of thinking comes up a lot in calculus, actually. Now, the absolute value of something that we know is never negative, as a simplification step, we remove the absolute value symbols. We can do that on the top. But wait a minute. Look at sine of theta. Can sine of theta be negative? Oh, you bet it can. Is that sine wave? Does that sine wave go below the horizontal axis? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> so sine of theta can be negative. Uh, we have no right to remove absolute value down here. We do up here because the argument here is guaranteed non-negative. Okay, so uh, 
I know that I have this so far. And that's as far as a student can go. It turns out that you don't need absolute value around sine of theta either. But the reason for that is harder to understand. The reason is that tangent of half theta, which was the original left-hand side here, tangent of half theta has the same sign of, as sine of theta. Uh, you could do a quadrant analysis, try some sample angles to see why, uh, but it's kind of hard to explain. You have to kind of play with that. But it turns out you can remove absolute value on the bottom. Uh, on an exam, I wouldn't push you on explaining why. But you do get this right-hand side for number 18. That identity way up here. And by a similar reasoning, where instead, since, since we're going to kind of copy this piece of the radicand down here, uh, if you multiply the radicand here by 1 plus cosine of theta over itself, then you're going to end up with the right-hand side for identity 19. So that's how you get basically these, uh, these other half angle identities for tangent, although we did have to take a leap of faith regarding our, our right to remove absolute value at the end. But the signs, S-I-G-N-S, do work out very nicely. There's no ambiguity, like over here for number 17. So those are the half angle identities. And again, for the product to sum and sum to product identities, there are four product to sum identities. Uh, these are nice if you're doing uh, derivatives or integrals because uh, calculus hates squares and also products and quotients. So uh, this is good for calculus. We, we like to do things term by term in calculus. So going from a product to something that looks more like a sum or a difference. So on an exam, for example, um, I, would, uh, I might give you an expression like this and I'd have you re-express it. Uh, I would show you this block of four identities. You pick the right one to use and then apply it. So basically on seeing this block of identities, be able to apply the appropriate one. But you wouldn't have to memorize these. Although these can be uh, verified from right to left by using the sum and difference identities. You can plug into here and here and prove this from right to left. And then from the product of sum identities, you can get the sum to product identities, where you express um, a sum of sign expressions as a product. Uh, this is helpful if you're solving equations, because remember, when you're solving equations, we like having a bunch of factors multiplied together equaling zero, a product of factors equaling zero. And that's good for solving equations. Uh, but again, uh, I would say something like re-express something of this form uh, using the sum to product identities. I would give you this list of four, you pick the appropriate one, and apply it appropriately. So do the homework. So. 19 plus 8. All right, so that's, uh, I think that's about. Hi, everyone. Uh, on the half angle identities, I'd like to show. I think, I think that was it. That better be it, right? <laughs> that's that. All right, any so, questions? 19 plus 8. Yep, that's it. All right. Okay, no more, no more. <laughs> All right, so. Um, well, we did a lot. Okay, we finished 5.3 on solving trig equations. Uh, we reintroduced and reviewed 19 plus 8 advanced trig identities. All right, any questions? Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next time on election night. Maybe I'll give you updates in chat, right? <laughs> I'll keep the TV on uh, mute, I guess. Uh, all right, I'll, I will take questions now. All right, I'll take questions now. Otherwise, have a good night. And by the way, I'll set up the tablet. Oh, and... Uh, uh, we're, let me ask, uh, ask in chat. I'm going to set the tablet, hold on. Again, very grateful for this thing. <laughs> All right, so um, any questions on the homework? Let's, let's get the homework file up. All right. Uh, let's see. Oops. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, number four. And yes, I, I am still grading. <laughs> I'm trying to get, uh, I guess, chapter zero next. 
All right, so let's start with the homework. All right. <clears throat> okay, now again, I'm, I'm still recording. If you want me to pause or stop, let me know. But I, I think students appreciate this. Okay, going in order, 5.12b. Remember, some of this is private chat if you're not seeing the requests. 5.12b. Okay, this, this one here, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so good time for me to set up the tablet here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have another cheat sheet. Lots of good cheat sheets up here. And by the way, if you can get um, uh, permissions from your instructors, I, I don't feel good about sharing them myself unless I get permission from the source. So if anyone can get me permissions, that'd be great. Okay, or the teacher, you know, if you know the teacher told you, it didn't matter. <laughs> okay, so, da, 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 um, yeah, I, I gotta get my, oh yeah, I put, I, I put them here. My whiteboards, let's get the whiteboards. All right. Again, still questions in chat, all right. Okay, so 5.12b, uh, that was in the private chat. All right, very good. So let's, uh, whoops, get this thing, whoop. <clears throat> get this thing set up here. Let's start with blue. I think red's too triggering, right? <laughs> let's get to, uh, is this okay? Oh. Yeah, it's good, all right. Okay, so we're doing, uh, this is 5.1, uh, 2B. All right, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and copy the left-hand side. You can put LHS. Okay, you should at least put LHS. I want to see where you're starting from, right? So tangent of theta plus cotangent, cotangent of theta all over cotangent of theta. And by the way, if you want me to switch to the mouse, which is slower, that's fine. Okay, uh, this is more liquid and smooth with the tablet, but I realize how some people might be distracted by the motion. So let me know if you want me to switch to the mouse. All right, so uh, the, the, the goal is to simplify, all right? Well, I think we're going to help ourselves if we, if we split at that primary plus sign on top. Let's split this into a sum of two fractions. All right, so I'm going to split this into a sum of two fractions. Tangent of theta over cotangent of theta plus, look at this, cotangent of theta over itself. Now this over here, this is looking very nice, right? Uh, and uh, don't worry about domain, domain issues or anything like that, but what's cotangent of theta over itself? Well, we get one. I think it's a good habit to put ones on the top and the bottom here, right? Uh, I'm, I'm just like leaving blanks. <laughs> All right. Now on the left side, and since these are two separate pieces, I can, I can do work on both of these at the same time, in the same step. So, all right, equals, oh, so actually, instead of breaking up into sine and cosine, I, I want to use the fact that these are reciprocals. So I'm gonna do this. I have tangent of theta, I'll write it this way. When you, uh, in fact, I'll even do this. When you divide by something that's not zero, what are you doing? you're multiplying by its reciprocal. In fact, you don't even need this particular step, but uh, just to be clear here, right? When you're dividing tangent of theta by cotangent of theta, what are you doing to tangent of theta, the top? You're multiplying it by the reciprocal, one over cotangent of theta, right? When you divide by cotangent of theta, you're multiplying by its reciprocal, and don't forget the plus one over here, from here, right? 
Okay. Question so far. But wait a minute. What is the reciprocal of cotangent of theta? What is one over cotangent of theta? Well, hey, it's tangent of theta. All right. Well, basic algebra, what is x times x? x times x is x squared. What is tangent of theta times tangent of theta? It is tangent squared of theta, and then we have the plus one. But we're not done yet, because this should smell familiar, right? This should be familiar. What are you thinking? Tangent squared of theta plus one. We have a square of a trig function, and we have a plus minus one type deal. What are you thinking? Whose identities are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking Mr. Pythagoras, the Pythagorean identities. Sometimes I go nuts with the tablet <laughs> by the Pythagorean identities. What is tangent squared theta plus one? Do you remember? Was it, what is tangent squared of theta plus one? It is, you should know this, secant squared of theta. And you can't really do much better than that, secant squared of theta. Uh, now, in case you forgot this, I'm always a fan of deriving things. That's what good mathematicians do, right? Uh, remember the big daddy, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. And then it, if you divide both sides by cosine squared theta, then you'll get this identity we're talking about. All right, because you're, you're gonna get tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. That's basically how you get this, right? So if you've forgotten um, the three Pythagorean identities, I hope you remember at least the first basic one here, you divide both sides by cosine squared theta. Again, you can break it up term by term. Tangent squared theta plus one is secant squared theta. I'm using that here. All right, secant squared theta. So I'm hoping that's my answer. It's good to, for me to check my own answers. <laughs> Yes, 2b, secant squared of theta, right. You can't do much better than that, secant squared of theta. Now, always look and ask, can I make that better? Not really. I mean, some people might say, well, I might prefer one over cosine squared theta. Well, I can understand that. But remember, when I say simplify, I generally mean make it as compact as possible. So we tend to prefer secant squared theta to one over cosine squared theta, okay? In fact, uh, I'm gonna call secant squared of theta simplified. One over cosine squared of theta, I might not call simplified, I have the right to mark you down. All right, so again, that's 5.12b. 5.12b, we're still recording, this is on the video, which I'll upload by midnight, I think, 1 a.m. Any questions? I will save this. I like saving all my good work here. Uh, this, whoops. Okay, this is uh, this is five. Oh, how come this won't type? <laughs> five one number two B. And yes, it's okay to copy if I'm doing it in class. Okay, that's fine. You took the time to stick around or watch the video. It's okay to copy what I have here, but I hope you understand it, all right? Okay, now, uh, what am I? Okay. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so uh, any questions? 
I'll keep this on the side here. Next, I see 5.21b. Again, if I skip you, please don't take offense. It's just that sometimes it's hard for me to, <laughs> to keep track of the chat. I, th I think 5.21b is next. And remember, some people are, private, are, are chatting privately, which is fine. Okay, so now we're looking at 5.21b. And on the tablet, I have to remember to point with the tip, not the end. Okay. All right. There we go. 5.21b. If I make a mistake, let me know. All right. Uh, so this one, right? 5.21b. Verifying trig identities. All right. Now, this is easier and simpler in the sense that I'm telling you what the target is. And remember, we normally go from the bigger, harder side to the smaller, more compact side. So we're probably going to go left to right. Although, if you can be very clever and go right to left, that's legal. Though here, it might be kind of hard to do, right? <laughs> okay, but remember the target. We're going to start the left-hand side and remember that, I'll, I'll use text. Remember the target. Keep it in mind. We're starting the left side and we're targeting the right side. All right, so keep the target in mind. Okay, so we're going to start the left-hand side. Now here, if you'll forgive me, uh, I won't recopy this. I'll just keep this on here. You can just write LHS. So when you show me your work, it's okay to just write LHS. Okay, but you should indicate what's, what part, what side you're starting on, but you don't have to recopy it if you write LHS or RHS. Okay, so over here. Um, let's try purple. It's good to have different colors. All right. So this is five, five point two one B. Now, again, uh, you don't have to recopy the left side if you write LHS. Okay. But you, you must indicate what side you're starting with. All right. Uh, again, if you have any questions, anyone uh, enter them in chat. I'm trying to keep track of the chat. Okay. So, LHS equals, we're targeting this guy. You know what? I'm going to move this. I'll do this. Put that there, and I'll put that there. Good. So we can keep the target in mind. Okay. Now, in fact, for some people, a substitution might help. Um, yeah, I could even do that. I could do a snap substitution, or, or, or let's, let's actually do a substitution. Let X equal sign of U. You don't have to do this, but... Uh, this might help us. Let x be sine of u, let y be cosine of u, so that the factoring's easier. Okay, if you don't like this, that's fine. Um, okay, so then sine of u, cosine of u would be x, y, minus, cosine of u is y, all over, sine of u is x, and then minus x squared. Okay, so it might be easier for us to factor with x and y here. On the top, we can factor out a y, and what do we get? Y times the quantity, X minus one. Don't forget, we have a minus one here. When we divide both terms up there by Y. On the bottom, the GCF is X. Up here, the GCF was Y. Down here, the GCF was X. X times the quantity, what? One minus X. In fact, I can just leave it in terms of X and Y for now. Take a look at this. We have X minus one on top. You might've had sine of U minus one on top over one minus X or one minus sine of U. How are X minus one and one minus X related? How are they related? They are, these two guys are opposites. which means, assuming they're not zero, which means when I divide them, I get what? If you divide opposites, what do you get? For example, what is five divided by negative five? Five divided by negative five is negative one. So I'm gonna do this. I'll put the negative one on top in parentheses so that, so that it's a factor, not a term up there, and then a one down below. All right. So I get y over x times negative one, basically. I'm gonna go back to uh, sine and cosine now. 
on the top, we end up with y was cosine of u. And don't forget, we had a negative 1 factor. Okay, all over x was a uh, sine of u. And I'm very, very close. Very, very close. Question so far. Question so far. The negative 1 factor pops out. I could have done this earlier, right? This guy pops out as, a, as basically a negative sign in front, right? Hey, folks. By the quotient identities, by the quotient identities, what is cosine of u over sine of u? What is cosine of u over sine of u? That is cotangent of u, right? Cotangent of u. Okay, don't forget your argument. So then our final answer will be the opposite of cotangent of u. And I really don't see how I can make that any better, right? I'm pretty sure that's the answer. 5.21b. Well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, of course, I, I gave you the answer. <laughs> yeah, so uh, but really, maybe I shouldn't box this in. I should just say QED, end of proof. You don't have to, but QED. This checks out. Matches the right-hand side. I gave you what the answer was, the opposite of cotangent of U. In fact, if I were responsible, I should have checked that, okay? Maybe that would have let me stop over here, for example, all right? But remember, you're aiming for the target. You must hit the target verbatim, exactly. Opposite of cotangent of u. But hey, if you can simplify it all on your own, that's a good skill. And then this is kind of like uh, sort of checking your work. Okay. And if you ever get lost, aim for the target, right? Any questions there? I'll give you a moment. I'll give you a moment as I save this work. Uh, 5.21b. And remember, those of you using a Mac, um, remember, you got to save in PDF form because PNG will let you change things after you save. All right. You're welcome. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Um, so I believe I, I hit the two that were asked here in chat. Uh, I'm still wide awake. So, uh, well, uh, you know, if, if you have to leave, I understand. Uh, I appreciate your hard work and time. I'm still here. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Have a great night and weekend and uh, have a safe election day. I'll see you on election day. Uh, any questions? Any questions? So I'll tell you what, I'll come back at 9.52 and I'll see if there are any more questions. 9.52, I'll be back. All right, so I'll uh, put that here. I'll be back at 9.52 p.m. to check on you. But if you have to go, I understand. Thank you for your hard work. All right, I'll be back.